Hello, Internet. Welcome to... <laughs> Screw it, you know by now. If I seem a bit off my game today, forgive me. You'll soon learn why. Pull up a chair, let's talk. Last episode caught you up on everything. And I do mean everything. All my past theories on FNAF 6, the gravestones, the masks, the names of the children inside the animatronics, the connections to the novels, and the identity of the puppet. But then I showed you this. The FNAF Survival Logbook. The book that, in seven years of doing this, finally broke me. A book that contains within its pages an elaborate series of codes that serve as the key to unlocking the identity of Golden Freddy. A freaking children's activity workbook with a dabbing chica in it is the thing to defeat me. Ugh. That dabbing chica taunts me in my nightmares. But Golden Freddy's unbreakable code is only the tip of the iceberg. This book is like a repeated kick in the balls, as everything I thought I knew about FNAF has crumbled in front of my eyes. It's like Freddy Fazbear got a hold of the Infinity Gauntlet and snapped his fingers and then all of my theories suddenly turned to dust. Because unlike the novels which have questionable canonicity, the survival logbook outright answers a lot of our questions about these games. But the answers that it provides just lead to more questions. And not stupid small questions either, like what's Mangle's gender? No! It upends huge parts of the story. The logbook is simultaneously the most important, most revealing, and most frustrating piece of evidence to ever be thrown into this franchise. You see, as I mentioned last time, this workbook once belonged to Mike a.k.a. Michael Afton. The book establishes that Mike writes his answers in red pen. It also establishes that there's a spirit possessing the book who speaks to Mike via lightly faded text. From what I can gather, it appears to be the spirit of Golden Freddy. And starting with that information, the logbook then proceeds to drop bombshell after bombshell, as far as lore reveals go. First, the book outright confirms what we've known for a while now, that Mike is the same Mike who works as the night guard during sister location. When asked what he would like for his one-week bonus, we see him doodling in the corners of the page baskets of money and baskets of exotic butters. On another page, he's drawing a smooth set of casual bongos. Sure, it's nothing earth-shattering, but when it comes to this franchise, getting any portion of any theory confirmed is a big win. And while that reveal might not be all that earth-shattering, you know what is? The book reveals that Michael Afton is who we play as in FNAF 4. On page 40, the workbook starts asking about dreams, and via his doodles, we see that Mike somehow knows the appearance of Nightmare Fredbear, something only the protagonist of FNAF 4 should be aware of. To further confirm this, on page 23 of the book, the spirit who uses the book to talk to Mike outright asks, was your favorite childhood toy a plastic purple telephone? Which, as you may remember, is a direct reference to the purple telephone on the ground in the FNAF 4 bedroom. And if you still think it's a coincidence, it's not. 20 pages later, the spirit starts talking about whether any of the toys on the page look familiar. Most don't, except for one the phone. Now, for the eight of you who still remember how this whole freaking story fits together, you might be asking me, but we all thought the protagonist of FNAF 4 was the crying child, the one who gets himself bitten during the birthday party because you have flashes of a hospital bed and hear a flatline at the end of the game. We also assumed that the animatronic nightmare was representative of death. And you know what? You're absolutely right. That is exactly what we've been thinking. And here's the thing. We weren't wrong. We've apparently been right about all of that, except there was one teeny tiny itsy bitsy little wrinkle that we didn't expect. Michael Afton was the bite victim. Michael Afton was the crying child. I know! I couldn't believe it either, but the proof here is unquestionable. On page 75, a page asking about imaginary friends and featuring the psychic friend Fredbear Plush, the spirit outright asks, does he still talk to you? And perhaps the most damning piece of evidence of all, on page 103, the huge reveal, quote, the party was for you. Mike Afton is confirmed to be the crying child. He's the bite victim. He's the one who, at the end of the game, apparently needed to be put back together. It seems undeniable at this point, but then that leads to the obvious next question, how could he have been bitten and died there, but then also be in sister location as an adult, gotten himself scooped, blah 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 blah, until FNAF 6 when he finally burns with the rest of his family. I have been smacking my head against a wall trying to make sense of it all. And I have some theories.
big surprise there. It's interesting. When I did my final FNAF theory, not that one, my final, final FNAF theory, N no, not that one either. Those are technically FNAF 6 theories. God, jeez, this one, this one. When I did this theory, I concluded that the story of FNAF was, at its core, a story about a family, the Afton family. But now it's becoming increasingly clear to me that it's really the story of Michael Afton specifically. Four games, one story, like Scott said back during the FNAF 4 days so long ago. It's the story of the crying child growing up, discovering the atrocities of his father, and then trying to make amends for those. We know for a fact that Michael Afton is the main character of FNAF 1 from the endgame Paycheck, sister location from the name tag in Custom Night, I found it. It was right where you said it would be. FNAF 6 from Henry's closing monologue, and now FNAF 4 from the Survival Logbook. And we're still not done. The Survival Logbook also connects Mike to FNAF 2. On page 56, the spirit asks, Was your favorite ride the carousel? A question that only makes sense if Mike had been to the FNAF 2 location, because it's the only one with a carousel. That means that the only game without a solid connection to Mike is FNAF 3, but then there's the whole... Father, it's me. Michael. Complete with a burned down Fazbear fright in the background, which seems to be hinting at him being the person who burned the place down, trying to put an end to his father's reign of terror. Michael Afton even shares a connection with the dead children whose names appear on the gravestones, going back to the survival logbook. See, I told you guys this thing was important. When the book asks about missing people on account of them being stuffed into animatronic suits, the spirit asks, do you miss them? It clearly connects Michael Afton to the other missing kids who go on to possess the animatronic suits. This means that Michael is connected to every game and every major character in the story. So let's update it to six games, one story. Michael's story. Which is all very beautiful to say, but seriously, what is that story? If you've been paying attention, we still have a pretty big elephant in the room, i.e. a dead kid who somehow grows up to become an immortal purple skin suit for robot spaghetti. Oh, and if the game wasn't complicated enough, Michael might not even be his real name. The spirit in the logbook repeatedly asks him, what do you remember? And even more importantly, do you remember your name? It's even hidden in the freaking word search, and I haven't even mentioned the other elephants in the room, like how very clearly the gravestones relate to the kids in the animatronic suits, and yet two of those names directly tie back to the security guards from FNAF 2. And if you want to go really, really deep like you know I love to do, you see Susie's font on her gravestone? Did you know it's the same font that's used to introduce each night of FNAF 4? That's something that no one else online has noticed, and if fonts are important, which remember, they probably are, Scott doesn't do coincidences, so four gravestones with completely different fonts is probably important in some way. Notice how two of the gravestones share the same font, but it's not Jeremy and Fritz, which you would probably expect since they're the two who are mentioned in FNAF 2. There are so many freaking elephants in this room. It is a very crowded room. Remember what I said earlier about repeated kicks to the crotch? <sighs> this. This is what I'm talking about. That said, after months of thinking about this and more kicks to the crotch than I care to mention, I think I do have an idea of what might be going on here. And it all begins in probably the most confusing place of all, Midnight Motorist from FNAF 6. When I first spoke about this minigame, I said that the mustard man here was William Afton, but I could tell that a lot of you weren't too convinced in my conclusion. And I'll be honest, I wasn't 100% sure of it either, but it was the best I could do at the time. But now, I am. I am a hundred percent confident that that is who we're seeing here. You see, FNAF 6 is simultaneously the end of the story as well as the beginning. It's the end because, well, everyone burns to death. And it's the beginning because it's the origin story of the puppet. And as we know, everything begins with the puppet. She's the one that allows all the other animatronics to become possessed, as we see in FNAF 2. Which makes the security puppet minigame pretty much the earliest event we ever see in any of these games. And we also know that it's William who killed Charlotte in that back alley. This is the origin story of the purple guy, complete with his purple car that we saw in FNAF 2 after all. But here's the detail I was missing before. If you brighten up the final screen of the security puppet minigame, you'll see tire tracks left by the purple car driving away from his crime. This leads directly
directly to the events of Midnight Motorist, which happens immediately after his murder. Here's how we know this for sure. Not only are you driving a purple car, and not only is it raining in both of the minigames, so they're connected on both those fronts, but get this. Reddit user GB Aura found that this section of the game in the source files is titled Later That Night, giving us the time connection we needed to know 100% that Orange Guy is William Afton. He kills Charlotte in the rain outside of Fred Bear's, drives away, and winds up back home later that night. Boom! Proven, locked and loaded. And looking at this minigame, knowing what we know now about Michael being the crying child, we know that the couch potato here is his older brother. Mr. Foxy Mask, let me shove my brother into an animatronic mouth and get him killed, speaking in his signature gray text, who apparently no longer has a name, which leaves Michael as the one who escaped to that place again. That is who William is mad at, with that place being obviously none other than Freddy's. And from there, a lot of pieces start to fit together. William's frustration with Michael escaping explains why we see him have surveillance cameras all over his house and sister location. It's not an experiment or anything, he is literally keeping tabs on the boy who keeps running away. It also explains why we see Michael, the crying child, locked in his room throughout FNAF 4. William himself says at the end of Midnight Motorist that Michael will be sorry when he gets back. And he is, as William comes constantly locks him in his room, making him unable to escape anymore. All of this might even explain the rationale for the nightmare animatronics. William built them, or else used his mind-altering sound disc that first appeared in the book and that we talked about in a previous theory, to scare Michael so that he would stop wanting to go to the restaurant in the first place. That's why he's so scared of the place when we see him in FNAF 4. I, I'm literally in the recording closet right now recording this and suddenly suddenly things started to fit together in a weird way. I'm just going to throw this in here right as it happened in my mind. I'll need to look into this later, probably a future theory, but let's just bring it up now. Orange guy is William, right? But he's turned away at the front door of Junior's, which is completely random and everyone's like, why is this in the minigame? Well, could it be because of the investigation into the missing children's incident? Remember what phone guy said from FNAF 2? Uh, from what I understand, the building is on lockdown. Uh, no one is allowed in or out, you know, especially concerning any previous employees. Afton is rejected at the front door of the building because of the lockdown, and because he's a previous employee. It makes the timeline a bit messy, and I'll have to go back and rework it, but something about this feels right. William Afton was fired from his job, goes back to Junior's, but the building is under investigation because of the missing children's incident. William, being a former employee, is turned away at the door. He's not allowed in. It's not a bar. It's nothing like that. It's Freddy Fazbear's Junior or something, the second location, the FNAF 2 location. Anyway, Anyway, I just wanted to throw that in there because it just occurred to me as I was writing this thing. I haven't had time to fully flesh it out or work it into the script, but I thought it was important enough to include, break the flow of things. Regardless, it gives us something else to chew on. Now back to the actual episode as I wrote it. Okay, I continue to avoid the obvious question here. Michael's death and apparent rebirth. If I'm being honest, it's because I don't really have a fully fleshed out explanation for it. It's less of a theory and more of a hypothesis, really. So would you be so kind as to Freddy Fazbear with me? as I go through what I think might be happening here. We know that Michael Afton is special, right? I mean, we see him get scooped, become a pile of rotten flesh, and yet he is still able to survive. In short, when we see him in sister location, he's not altogether human. Now, hold on to that idea for a second for me. While we're on the topic of sister location, let's look at the immortal and the restless. The super random soap opera from the game with a name that, now that I say it aloud in context, actually starts to make a little bit more sense. It stars Vlad, an immortal vampire who's dressed in purple who starts every episode saying Clara, I tell you, the baby isn't mine. And in FNAF we have William Afton, a man who's apparently immortal enough to survive a springlock failure, who, like a vampire sucks the remnant out of children and who knows, maybe survives on it and is represented by the color purple. It's actually a lot of similarities. So could the repeated lines of Not my baby. The baby isn't mine. The baby isn't mine. Act actually relate to William's relationship with Michael. What if Michael isn't actually William's son? It seems like it would be a logical leap, but we know for a fact that Michael's real name isn't Michael. Remember what the logbook said. Do you remember your name? Well, of course he does logbook. He wrote it on the front cover, Mike. Unless, of course, that's not his real name. 
So you got all those details? Good, because here's where all this random observation comes together. In the novels, one of the big overarching storylines is that the main character, Charlotte, had a twin who was kidnapped by Springtrap when she was younger. At the end of the second book, it's revealed that the twin wasn't actually kidnapped, it was her. Which seems to imply that Charlotte and her twin were one and the same, or were somehow interchangeable. Then, in the final pages, Charlotte dies from a springlock failure, only to miraculously come back to life unscathed in the next few days as if nothing had ever happened. There are also a lot of clues sprinkled throughout the book that William Afton has the ability to create hyper-realistic humanoid robots. I even mentioned that briefly during a past FNAF theory. I haven't even gotten to how I think the main character of the book series is probably a robot, but again, those are all theories for other days. Long story short, everything seems to point to Charlotte in the books being an AI. Maybe at one point she was a person, but she died or was kidnapped at an early age, and ever since, her personality has been programmed into a computer where she's now able to be replicated over and over again into a super advanced robot that's somehow now able to grow and develop. I didn't write the books, okay? Now, obviously, the two are vastly different canons, but the games and books do relate in a lot of ways, and we know in the games from William's daughter Elizabeth that full-on personalities of individuals can get programmed into AI. Elizabeth goes on to possess the spirit of baby. So what if, what if Michael is just one of those? Sure, he was killed in the Bite of 83, but when William promised to put him back together, it meant literally put him back together. Find a way to piece him back together using some combination of robotics expertise and miracle soul juice remnant. That's how Michael dies in FNAF 4, but somehow comes back to life in later games. It's how he's able to get scooped, get a bunch of robot spaghetti shoved into him, and then still survive when the robot spaghetti gets puked out of him. It's why he would no longer be able to remember his original name, and after he realizes the truth about what he actually is, that he's no longer human, he decides to end it all in the inferno of FNAF 6, after having done his best to set the souls of his former friends free. Oh boy, that is a lot. And between all these reveals and last week's code, there is a ton for us theorists to start chewing on. But now you get an idea of why I've been beating myself up for months trying to put this whole thing together. It upends mostly everything that we thought we knew about the franchise. Sure, it answers some of our questions, like Midnight Motorist and a bit more about FNAF 4, but it opens the door to a lot of new avenues to explore. Anyway, the final book in the FNAF trilogy, The Fourth Closet, is coming out soon. I know a bunch of it leaked online, already, but I'm trying to stay blind to it so as not to spoil anything in my theories. And even more exciting, Scott is releasing Ultimate Custom Night soon, so between those two, I am certain that there'll be more clues on the way helping us to come to a final conclusion to all of this. We put you back together and take you apart all over again. So until then, remember, it's all just a theory. A game theory. With some game hypothesis thrown in there for good measure. Thanks for watching. By the way, if you like the FNAF theories and you haven't checked out our theories on Petscop, well then what are you waiting for? Check it out. Petscop is a lot like the new FNAF, except even more obscure and even more creepy, but uh, you can't play the game, unfortunately. So anyway, that theory's to the left. And if you have any hopes of ever achieving a final answer as to the lore of this franchise, you know what you're gonna have to do, and that is jump scare that subscribe button. You've got five seconds to do it before the video ends. Five, four, three,